I'm going to put a few snippets up on the screen, and I want you to tell me if you can spot the code smell within these snippets that's suggesting to use the factory or abstract factory programming pattern. The factory pattern is hands down the pattern that I use most often. In fact, I probably use it every day. But how do you know when to use a factory? Well, that's a good question. For those of you that are new to the channel, my name is Adam. I'm a senior software engineer. I want to show you how to use software engineering principles to make your games better and faster. So let's get into it. So the first thing I want to talk about today isn't actually a pattern, but it sounds like it. You'll often hear people say, I'm going to use a static factory method. What they really mean is they're going to use a static creation method. Now, if we look at the example on the screen here, you can see that the network player constructor is taking in the two arguments, but it's also performing some game logic. Whenever you see that, that's a code smell. Another programmer, or even you in the future, coming to make a new network player, would have no idea unless you came in here and looked at the code that something else was happening in the constructor. So that's why we make a static method that encapsulates the creation of the object and the logic that's going to happen. So let's do that now. I'll just come down here and create a new public static method that returns a network player, takes in the same arguments as the constructor, and we'll create a new player, we'll run our game logic, and then we'll return that player. Now we can remove that extra logic from our constructor. Let's change the name of the static method so that it's clear that there's more than just object creation going on. We can call it create and register. Now we can make the public constructor private. The only way to create a new network player now is to call our create and register method. Most of the time when you see a private constructor in a class like this, there's usually a static creation method somewhere lurking about that you probably should be using. All right, let's get into the factory programming pattern. Let's quickly talk about the code smells that suggest using a factory pattern here. The first and probably most obvious is that we have a switch statement that's creating concrete objects in our start method. This means we've tightly coupled the knight object to the sword and the bow and any other weapons that we create in the future. You can imagine that in the future, if you wanted to remove bow and replace it with short bow and long bow, you need to come back into the knight class and change all the logic here. And not just the knight class, you would have to go into the soldier class and the archer class, etc. So the next code smell here is that this is a violation of the single responsibility principle. Not only is the knight going to be responsible for its own knightly logic, but it's also responsible for creating its own weapons at runtime. It's probably also worth pointing out that I'm using a string to define the weapon type, which is obviously prone to human error. So I've made an empty file over here that I've just called Weapon Factory. And inside I've got the interface for my eye weapon, and then I've defined a sword and a bow of type eye weapon. And what we want to do is create a factory. The factory's responsibility is to provide a product to the consumer. So in this case, the knight is the consumer. And the product we're going to supply to them is the weapon. So let's make two concrete versions of this factory. We'll call Sword Factory and Bow Factory. As you can see, they each supply a concrete weapon type. Okay, let's jump back over to our Knight class and refactor this. So first of all, let's get rid of our string there and we'll have a reference for our Weapon Factory. So in the start method, we could say Weapon Factory equals new Sword Factory. Now our object is supplied by the factory method. But you might notice one other problem here. We're now tightly coupled to the sword factory. There's a few different ways to get around this, but I would suggest the best one is to use scriptable objects. So why don't we make our weapon factory extend a scriptable object. Then we can add some create asset menu attributes to all of our concrete implementations of factories. If we come back into the knight and change this to be a serialized field, now we can add a factory to our knight prefab directly from the inspector. There's still a few issues here though. What if a game designer forgets to assign a factory to this knight prefab? We get a null reference exception on line 8. So one thing we can do is assign a default weapon and then just do a null check on the weapon factory. Another thing we can do is if you have Odin Inspector, they have a great attribute called required. This will give a nice alert in the inspector if it's missing and it would trip up Odin Validator as well. We're still tightly coupled to the sword object here. What else can we do? So to avoid tight coupling here, we don't want the knight to know about swords and bows and every other type of weapon there is. It should only know about eye weapon. 
let's set up our interface with a static method that will always return a default. So I'll jump back over into the interface and we'll just have our static method here returning iWeapon and for now let's just say return new sword. Because we've implemented scriptable objects, don't forget that all mono behaviors and scriptable objects have to be in files with the same name as the class name. So I'll just move those away and then I'm going to come back into the night class and I'm going to attack during the start method so we can see a message in our debug log. Let's jump back into Unity and we'll see this in action. So I've got a familiar character here and I'm going to add our night component to it. You can see right away the Odin validator is showing me an error. Weapon factory is required. That wouldn't stop us from running the game, but it lets us know that there is a problem. So in case you've never seen this before, if you were to open up the validator, you can double click on any error. It'll take you to the game object with the problem. You can fix it. You can also bulk fix some issues. Not this one, of course, but uh, it's an extremely useful tool. As you can see, I haven't set a weapon factory at all. And if I go to play, you can see I get the message swinging the sword. So the interface has supplied us with a default implementation. Okay, so that's all working great. We've completely decoupled weapons from the knight. So let's see how this would work if we actually created a scriptable object factory. So it's a little bit off screen there, but I'm creating a new bow factory. And if I select my knight again, I can just drag that into the weapon factory serialized field. Now we should be supplied with anything that the bow factory is going to provide at runtime. If I press play here, watch the debug message change. So with this implementation, we've solved all those code smells that we saw from the very beginning. And if you've got your head wrapped around the factory programming pattern, the abstract factory is very, very simple. I'm going to start by declaring a new piece of equipment and we'll make an interface for that, iShield. Now, an abstract factory is really just a collection of factories or services that belong together. Imagine you're making an RTS game where all of your archers need one set of equipment and all of the knights need another set of equipment and all of your soldiers need another type of equipment. Well, to do that, we can make an equipment factory that actually gathers up the other factories together. So I'm just going to move all of the shield related items into its own class that I'll call shield factory. So the interface, the concrete shield. And once I've got that sorted out, we can make a concrete version of the shield factory and I'll just call it generic shield factory. It'll return a new shield and I'll put that into its own class. Can add a create asset menu for that. So if we come back over to the soldier class now, we can have a reference to our new abstract factory, which will wrap up all of our other factories into one class. I'm just going to jump back over to our weapon factory and declare my new equipment factory here, and then I'll move it into its own class. Now, Copilot knows what I want to do already. So I'm just going to tab complete this, and then I'll move it over and we can have a closer look at it. So our equipment factory scriptable object now will have its own methods for creating weapon, create shield, which will in turn use its own factories inside. Now I can change these to ternary operations because there's not really any more complex logic going on here right now. Back in the soldier class, let's remove references to these factories that we don't need to access anymore. Instead, we can define our weapon and shield directly from the equipment factory. Now we've really simplified things a lot. Let's jump over into Unity and have a look. So I'm going to remove the knight component from our hero. Then I'm going to make a new instance of an equipment factory and a new instance of a generic shield factory. Back on the hero, let's add the soldier component. Now we can drag a reference from our equipment factory into the soldier. And if we go and check out the equipment factory, it has references to a weapon factory and a shield factory. So let's add those references in there. Now, just so we can see this in operation, I'm going to jump back into the soldier here. And in the start method, we can run attack and run defend as well. That'll give us some output in the console. So I'll clear the console out here and press play. Watch what happens. So as expected, we have two messages here, shooting an arrow and blocking with the shield. So our abstract factory is working just as we expected it to. And you could make as many of these abstract factories for any different type of unit that you want. And it completely removes the need for you to reference concrete classes 
inside of your different units. Just for interest's sake, we could actually make this a little bit simpler. If you didn't need to cache references to your weapon and shield inside of the unit, you can actually just call the factory directly. Now you've got a couple nested dots here, which some people frown upon. Me personally, I think for this kind of a thing, I might not go this far with it, but look how simple you can actually make the soldier class now. I mean, essentially it's three lines of code. Another thing you can do with factories is right now the factory is creating a new instance of whatever it is we need every time we call it. Well, if you're not going to cache the weapon or the shield inside the unit, maybe you want to do that inside the factory. If it's always returning the same item, just create it one time, and the next time you call create weapon, you can just provide the one that you already created and cached. If you were going to do this, I would suggest changing the name of the method from create method to maybe call it provide weapon, something like that. So how is this going to make your life easier as a developer? Well, first of all, anytime you introduce a new weapon now, you don't have to make any changes to your units. All you have to do, create the new weapon, create a factory for that weapon, and assign that factory to your equipment factory. Voila, all the units will instantly change. You don't have to change any of your code at all. And that's because you've completely decoupled the weapons from your units. So the units depend on our factories supplying the items, but they don't care where these objects come from or how they're made. And that, my friends, is the power of the abstract factory. Remember, the factory doesn't have to supply game objects. It could supply anything. So that could be network configuration. That could be access to your repository for saving data. Really, there are no limits. Factories are just a great way to decouple your code. So hit that like button if you learned something new today. There'll be more videos on programming patterns coming up in the future. If you like that video, click on one of these boxes on your screen and I'll see you in another one.